In this first of countless video installments that I will create and post, I will teach you about chemical equilibrium. In my typical style, I'd like to begin with a funny chemistry cat from quickmeme.com. This one says, Girl, do you know you have 11 protons? Because you are sodium fine. <laughs> okay, after this set of lectures, which will cover sections 1 through 4 of chapter 15, you should be able to explain what dynamic equilibrium is, generate an equilibrium constant expression Kc for an equilibrium chemical reaction, convert Kc to Kp, perform calculations that involve combining multiple reaction equations to obtain data for a final reaction, and generate an equilibrium constant expression Kc for heterogeneous equilibrium reactions. That's the lineup. I'd like to get started by first introducing you to equilibrium. The word equilibrium actually derives from two Latin terms, equi, which means balanced, and libra, which means weight. Thus, when we have a chemical reaction in equilibrium, we have some type of balanced or equal weight between reactants and products. Or, as our book states, to be in equilibrium is to be in a state of balance. A tug of war in which two sides pull with equal force so that the rope does not move is an example of a static equilibrium, one in which an object is at rest. Equilibria can also be dynamic, as illustrated in the chapter opening photograph, which shows cars traveling in both directions over a bridge that serves as an entry to the city. If the rate at which cars leave the city is the same as the rate at which they enter, then the two opposing processes are in balance, and the net number of cars in the city remains constant. Until now, we've talked about reactions that have a one-way arrow, such as this one, in which reactants A and B convert to products C and D. In this chapter, we'll begin talking about reactions that have two-way arrows, like this one. These type of reactions are called equilibrium reactions. So what is chemical equilibrium? Or in other words, what does this two-way arrow mean? Well, what it means is that the forward and reverse reactions are both occurring simultaneously at the same speed. Once a reaction reaches that kind of state, we say that it is in a state of chemical equilibrium. When equilibrium is reached, concentrations of reactants and products stop changing, making the reaction appear to be stopped. I hasten to mention, however, that the reaction is not stopped. All that's happening is that any time you have reactants A and B converting into products C and D, you have products C and D converting backwards to reactants A and B at the exact same rate. Thus, at chemical equilibrium, concentrations of reactants to products remain the same, even though there still is conversion occurring back and forth and back and forth and back and forth at the same rate. Got it? Good. Now I'm going to throw a wrench in the works. One thing you need to understand is this. Just because a system is at equilibrium, that does not mean that there are the same amounts or equal amounts of reactants and products. Doesn't mean that. I could have tons more reactant than product, or tons more product than reactant. Or I might have about the same of both, or somewhere in between. The only thing that it means is that when I'm at chemical equilibrium, the speed with which reactants convert to products is the same as the speed at which products convert backwards to reactants. That's what chemical equilibrium means. But the relative amounts of reactants to products on both sides of the arrow could be very different. So in our last chapter, to which I'll link here, we learned about rate laws and rate constants. For example, in this reaction, A converting to B, if it's first order with respect to A, then its rate law is that. We also learned that such reactions rate constants, K, do not depend on the reaction's stoichiometry. An equilibrium reaction, however, which has a two-way arrow, is actually two reactions occurring simultaneously at the same rate. The forward reaction, A converting to B, and the reverse reaction, B converting back to A. Now, because those two reactions are occurring at the same rate, we can actually say that the rate law of the forward reaction is equal to some constant K multiplied by the concentration of A. And that rate is also equal to some rate constant K of the reverse reaction multiplied by the concentration of B. In other words, I've got two reactions. Hopefully that makes sense. So this means algebraically that the concentration of B divided by the concentration of A is equal to K forward divided by K reverse. Now if you don't believe me, please pause the video, go back to the previous slide, and see if you can rearrange the terms I just showed you to make sure that this makes sense. You should find that they indeed do. Because K forward and K reverse are both constants, we can simplify this to just say that the concentration of B divided by the concentration of A is just equal to some constant. <laughs> Got it? K. 
Hence, the overall equilibrium rate constant, which I'll call Kc for this reaction, is equal to the concentration of B divided by the concentration of A. Thus, unlike one-way reactions, the constant for equilibrium reactions does depend only on the stoichiometry of the reaction and not on its mechanism. Also, just so you know, Kc has no units. Now, generally speaking, then, for any reaction like this one, for instance, where we have a two-way arrow as opposed to a one-way arrow, the equilibrium rate constant Kc is going to be equal to the concentrations of the products raised to exponents that are equal to their coefficients divided by the analogous terms for the reactants. You should note that I told you in an earlier lecture that for general rate laws, the exponents here are not necessarily equal to the coefficients. For equilibrium reactions, where we have two-way arrows, they indeed are. So now I'm going to ask you a question. If the equilibrium rate constant is greater than 1, so in other words, if Kc here is much larger than 1, what does that tell us? I'll let you pause this here and think about it before I tell you the answer. OK, here's the answer. If Kc is much, much larger than 1, that tells us that at equilibrium, the concentrations of C and D are much, much larger than the concentrations of A and B. Hence, at equilibrium, in that circumstance, the amounts of C and D would be much greater than the amounts of A and B. And equilibrium would favor, concentration-wise, products over reactants. Now, what if Kc, the equilibrium constant, were much lower than 1? What could we say then? Well, we could say that at equilibrium, the concentration or amounts of reactants in that case would be much larger than products. Now, what if Kc was equal to 1 or close to 1? What could we say then? Well, in that case, we could say that at equilibrium, the relative concentrations of products to reactants are about equal. I want you to keep that in mind for a question that I'll ask you momentarily, which takes us to some beautiful lecture questions. Foremost, which of the following expressions is the correct equilibrium constant expression for the equilibrium between dinitrogen tetroxide, this thing, and nitrogen dioxide, that thing? I'm not going to answer this for you, but we'll let you attempt to do it on your own. And this question, when the following reaction comes to equilibrium, does the equilibrium mixture contain mostly reactants or mostly products? Once again, I'm not going to answer this question for you, but we'll give you some guidance. We should note, looking at this, that the equilibrium constant is right here. Is that number much larger than 1, much smaller than 1, or equal to 1? Having answered that question, you should be able to determine, based on what I told you a few moments ago, which side is favored, either reactants or products. I'll let you once again do that on your own. We've now learned about Kc, which is the generic equilibrium constant. I'm now going to teach you about another equilibrium constant called Kp. Kim possible. As it turns out, when all of your reactants and products are gases, you can actually uh, come up with an equilibrium constant that's in terms of pressure. That is called Kp. Thus, for any reaction like this one, the pressure rate constant, or Kp, is equal to the individual pressures of each of the products raised to exponents that are equal to their respective coefficients divided by the individual pressures of the reactants raised to exponents that are equal to their respective coefficients. That is Kp. So Kc, once again, is this equilibrium expression in terms of concentration, usually in moles per liter. Whereas Kp is the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure, usually in atmospheres or millimeters of mercury or something. Now Kp and Kc can be interconverted by using this equation. Kp is equal to Kc multiplied by Rt raised to the delta n where R is the ideal gas constant. And this is the version that I usually use. You want to make sure that you choose an ideal gas constant that has matching units. T is the temperature in kelvins. And delta N is? Well, delta N is the number of moles of gaseous products minus the number of moles of gaseous reactants. And that's all based on the coefficients in the balanced chemical reaction. In other words, it's the change of moles as you go from left to right in the chemical reaction. I've now introduced you to Kc and Kp. Let's take a look at some problems. Given the falling reaction at equilibrium, if Kc equals this number at 25 degrees Celsius, what is Kp? I'll let you look at this. You're welcome to attempt it on your own. And if you want to watch me do it, you can click a link here to a separate video in which I'll do it on my whiteboard. That takes us to the end of this lecture video. Please stay tuned to my next one, which I'll continue teaching you about chemical equilibrium. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.